Um, I am the author of the forthcoming novel, native novel, Winter Counts, coming from HarperCollins, and Spotted Tail, coming from Raycraft Books. So when I was offered the chance to speak with Dr. Saul, I jumped at it, uh, because I have been aware of this gentleman's works for some time. When I was a doctoral student at the University of Texas in Austin, I read Voltaire's Bastards in its uh, first edition. Um, is, this, is this on? Yeah. Do I have to do <laughs> there, it's on. Uh, anybody who reads Voltaire's Bastards has strong arms. <laughs> well, it was... It was uh, <laughs> the mind I take for granted. I mean, you're... <laughs> it was overwhelming, and, and, and it was wonderful. But, but since then, um, he has obviously written a number of other works, uh, one of which is, is my privilege to speak with him today, and that is The Comeback. So The Comeback, I'm going to read just a little bit, and then I'm going to turn over to him. I have some questions. Can I just say, sure. so I, I was in the earlier session that you chaired, and, and I mean, I, I haven't read enough but I read the, in the first four pages of your new novel. What is it called? It's Winter Counts. And it's a terrifyingly funny uh, beginning, and I have absolutely no idea what you're going to do after those first four pages. Because really, a lot of writers would be happy to do that in 100 pages. It was re it's really wonderful. And I, I, I thought this um, essay of yours, Major Crimes, is fantastic. And uh, Carlisle Longing. So I really enjoyed getting to know what you write. I think it's really exciting. Well, thank you so much, John. And uh, I was privileged to speak with him on the phone from Toronto uh, uh, last week. Um, you know, and I actually got ahead of myself here. I'd like to uh, give a land acknowledgement. First of all, Ampetu uh, uh, Dr. David Cheska, Wambly Wyden, and I do want to acknowledge uh, the Cheyenne and Arapaho people upon whose land that we now stand. And so, but if you, were here, if you were at my earlier session today, you know that I believe that a land acknowledgement is an empty gesture without a call to action. And so I am including my call to action today is I, I would like to bring awareness to the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women. I'm an expert on American natives, or hopefully an expert, and we have a huge problem as it exists in Canada with the problem of missing and murdered indig indigenous women. So I urge you to educate yourself about this topic and if you can help out in any way. So with that, I, I, can I just, please. I, I would love to, and, and this is really interesting, the land acknowledgement. As I understand it, it's not habitual in public events in the United States. So in the last, one of the outcomes of the Truth and Reconciliation Royal Commission, we've now had five Royal Commissions on in Indigenous Affairs, and this is probably it. So I think people no longer have any excuse for not understanding what's been done and what needs to be done. There were 94 recommendations in the last uh, 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 commission, and, and one of them was to do um, a land acknowledgement at the beginning of every public ceremony. And, and what's fascinating is it happens, and they're, they're very precisely negotiated, so they're very accurate. And we're now at the stage where people are saying, wait a minute, I've heard that before. So there's a little bit of grumbling. And people like me are saying, well, that's because the moment has come to do what you just did, which is say, what does this really mean? What is the purpose of this? For example, people who go to church, I haven't noticed that the, uh, the, the protocols of a church ceremony change every Sunday, right? I haven't noticed that when the Senate or the House of Commons meet that every opening is different. It's identical. Protocols are a sign of civilization. You begin with a protocol. And one of the most important protocols is, I think, in Canada, the United States, and frankly, throughout Latin America, Central and Latin America, and other parts of the world, Australia, New Zealand, um, is to... Is to walk away from the dominance of the colonial mindset, which includes the United States. After all, your theories of government are Enlightenment France and England, and your theories of nationalism are British 19th century, right? Let's, let's be clear about that, right? And that's what you're struggling with because it has nothing to do with the reality of the United States, which is much more troubling and much more interesting than, that, than those things. But, uh, Locked into all of that, into the ex-British and French empires, you were the first ones to get out of, the, of, of those two, um, locked in is this idea of common law, or in the French co case, civil code. And it's really a barbaric uh, black and white idea. Is this my land or your land? I bought it from you. I killed you and took it. It's mine now, it's no longer yours. You know, it, and we will live and die over the ownership of land. This is as if our soul is in this completely 
pre-civilization idea of what land in is and ownership. And one of the most important blockages in the environmental movement comes from the English-speaking world, quite frankly, led by your country, but you know, many of us are with you on blocking good action. Uh, Canada's a little bit better, but not every day. Um, Ed, Britain is you know, problematic, is, is that we're stuck on this idea, you can't tell us what to do with our land. Forget about guns. You can't tell us what to do with our land. I'm terribly sorry. It's not your land. Land doesn't belong to people. And so moving into civilization, which would be an interesting idea for us, um, <laughs> would involve a more sophisticated approach towards the relationship between people and land. And that is that, it, yeah, there are, of course, you bought your house and it's your house, whatever, and there are some rules, but there are, it's multi-layered. And what the land acknowledgements remind us of is how complex it is and how much more sophisticated the indigenous philosophy of the relationship between human beings and land is than the English and French philosophy. Much more sophisticated, much more careful, much more layered about we have responsibilities. Uh, we're here for a while. Uh, yes, we have some sort of, sort of technical right to be on it, but that's all that is. Uh, we actually have enormous obligations and we have a relationship to and with the land, even if we have a condo on the 17th floor. And so these are land acknowledgements for me. If you didn't walk out when David read the land acknowledgement, that means you sort of bought into the idea that you don't want to be a barbarian inheritor of Britain and France. They do rather be a much more civilized person and start adopting indigenous philosophies about the relationship of human beings to land. So that's my comment. On it. You can see what a what a tremendous honor it is to speak with this gentleman on the phone. I, I just wanted to keep talking and talking, but, but we only have a certain amount of time here. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 listen. I mean, you're, you know, he, there's such wisdom coming from here. But I want to turn our attention, so if you're not aware, this is the book about which we're speaking today, The Comeback, by John Ralston Saul. Now, I'm an enrolled citizen of this Sichangu Lakota nation in South Dakota, and so my frame of reference is indigenous matters in America. I am not an expert in Canadian indigenous matters, and so I read this. And I'm not in American. So we're we gonna, agreed we're, on the phone about gonna, this. <laughs> we're gonna meet in the middle somewhere. So, so I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask John to give us the thesis, because as you can tell from the title of the book, The Comeback, he believes that indigenous people are making a real comeback in Canada. Now, I think the question is, is the same true in the United States. But let me set the stage by asking John, could you tell us a little bit about the thesis of the comeback and how you came to write the book? Well, look, this is the, so I've written 14 or 15 books. This, this is the fourth Canadian book. Then there's this whole row of what you, I don't know, international books, if you like. They're linked, but, and, and, um, and before this, I wrote a book called A Fair Country, which is the, has a lot of irony in the word fair, after all. Fair can mean beautiful, uh, just, but also mediocre, right? Uh, and, about Canada. And, and before that, something called Reflections of a Siamese Twin. And I was gradually creeping my way as a non-Indigenous person who discovered the profound ignorance I had through education, everything, when I was, in 19, in May 19, I remember precisely the moment, May 1976, when I realized that I had my first PhD, my first doctorate, and I knew nothing, because our education system, like yours, was totally vacant on this subject, because we had whitewashed it, you started before us, but we got really going in the late 19th century, uh, covering up hundreds of years of history, therefore denying the role that indigenous people played. So I started slowly and carefully, I had you know, hundreds and hundreds of indigenous friends and check, I checking everything with everybody because I'm not indigenous. I have no right to say anything on behalf of an indigenous person. I would never dare do that. What I do have an obligation to do as a non-indigenous person is to turn to the 95% of the population of Canada who aren't indigenous and say, for Christ's sake, you're not doing your job. You're not carrying your weight. You have the seats in Parliament. You have the power. You have the budget. You're not acting in a responsible manner. And I can use my power to do that. And as president of Penn International, you know, that's the, I, I assume you all, you all know Penn? Yes. So there's one in the States, in New York. There are 
two in Canada, there are 150 Penn centers, 125 countries, and it's like a UN with no money. Uh, so it's 35,000 writers, and so I was elected president of the whole thing, which is like, take all the problems of the UN and take away the money. <laughs> so you go in for six years to see dictators around the world to tell them to stop killing people and that they should release people from jail, and all you've got is your brains and the language. You go in with other writers because, you know. Uh, and and, and uh, I, so I started working my way up to talking about what a non-Indigenous person could say to non-Indigenous people about what had happened, where we were, and what we should be doing on our side. Not giving lessons, not saying we're going to do this for you in some horrible paternalistic or maternalistic way, but this is our job, this is our responsibility. And so these were very complicated. The first two books were very complicated because I was feeling my way into what I could do, and I kept phoning people, you know, in different indigenous nations saying, you know, what do you think, can I get away with this? And, um, and then we were a year before the last federal election in Canada, a year and a half, and I thought, I can't let this election go by without intervening, and I'd never intervened formally in an election. I'm a, you know, I'm not a member of a political party. And uh, I have opinions on policies, but I never in, in, intervened as a, as a, on a big policy. So this book was written uh, without even knowing what I was doing. It ended up being an 18th century pamphlet to non-Indigenous Canadians saying, this is what it's about. And this is the most important issue in our country, by far, not taxes, not anything else. This is the important issue, Indigenous issue. We gotta get this right, and you have to vote for a party which will do something about this. Now, it, it meant automatically the elimination of the Conservative Party, but there were three other possible parties, you know. And I would say the same thing about the upcoming election. You must vote for a party which will continue to do uh, something about Indigenous issues, because it's now moving, and moving relatively fast. But like all really complicated issues where you have 100 to 150 years of wrongdoing, it's, I heard uh, one of the great, great uh, Métis lawyers speaking the other day, Jean Taillé, uh, and she said it's like this enormous dinosaur you're trying to turn around. So four years is enough to get everybody upset. But to turn this whole thing around, it's happening. But it's going to be tough. And the book is like anybody can take that book and there are lines in it they can use. And I think it can be used outside of Canada too. Tell us about the comeback. So we talked a little bit about this on the phone. My contention is that natives in Canada play a larger space culturally, intellectually, politically than they do in the United States. We are, we natives, we American Indians, are about 1.5% of the American population. That may even be too high. We, you know, is there possibly a comeback happening here? We can come back to that. My contention is that natives play a lesser role in the United States than they do in Canada. And so the thesis of, of your book is that there is this comeback happening on a number of different fronts. Can you spell this out for the folks who have not had the chance yet to read it? Yeah, well, I mean, basically, you know, it's about 5% in Canada. And uh, according to St Statistics Canada, it's, it's on its way to 7% in the next decade. So that means that in any election campaign, they can, they can uh, out of the, how many seats are there in Parliament? 325? 300 and something in the lower part. They, they can probably switch 12 seats, which is 24 seats, right? Take away 12, give 12. And uh, that's the difference between a majority and not a majority. Um, they have, indigenous people have in, in growing influence in a whole bunch of areas. In about 1900, uh, people like my grandparents and great-grandparents were convinced they'd done their job that they got it from two million down to about 175,000 indigenous people. And all they had to do was set up the residential schools, like in the United States, and the rest would just be away into nothingness. And it was exactly at that moment of hopelessness that the indigenous leaders invented what they called in those days, the modern Indian rights movement. We moved from Indian to aboriginal to indigenous. So that's the term which is basically used, unless you're indigenous, which case, if you're First Nation, you can say of yourself you're an Indian, but that's very ironic, you know. So that's how complicated it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but the fact is, 
in the Constitution after 1982, the rights of the First Nations, the Métis, and the Inuit are guaranteed. They were always there, but it was clarified from 17, they were something, they were there, but it was clarified in the Constitution rewrite of 1982. Um, we had these five royal commissions. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada, which had been like, not as bad as yours, but pretty bad. Sorry, in your whole history of your Supreme Court, there are about 36 years where it actually served social justice, right? In ours, it was, until 1980s, about the same as yours. And, but since then, it has been a, a, a center of justice. And they've done about 30 rulings on indigenous issues since 1980s, I'm terrible on dates, 1980 something. And in every case, Indigenous peoples against the government of Canada, against the government of the provinces, against the corporations. In every case, the Supreme Court has ruled for the Indigenous people, more or less. You know, in every case, they've led the way on the non-Indigenous front, and this has given oomph. And then the last comment is that, that, so from this hopeless thing, they started fighting back, getting organized in a different way, and then after World War II, Indigenous people, it was, ours was a volunteer army in the Second World War. They represented the biggest per capita volunteer group. They came back and they had a lot of backing from their buddies in the army in particular. And the fight really got underway. By 1960, it was serious. And from 1960, when there were zero indigenous lawyers, today there are about 2,500. There were zero PhDs. There were a handful at universities. Today there are be about 35,000 indigenous people at universities every, at any one time. Uh, and it, there, there are a couple of presidents of universities. There are professors all across the country like you. I mean, we're just looking at a thing that's great writers, painters, uh, playwrights, Thompson Highway. And, 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 and I think one of the most exciting things is that the change around started to show in the arts. It started with the visual arts. Today, most Canadians imagine themselves, visual arts, they imagine themselves through Inuit art and West Coast indigenous art in, in large part. And then it moved to novels and plays and things. So it's, it's happening, but it's gonna be rough. It's not over, you know? I wanna jump in here for those of you who are not uh, specialists in law, and why would you be, uh, indigenous law. Let me contrast what John is saying with the American experience. So in the United States, there were three Supreme Court cases in the early 1800s called the Marshall Trilogy. The Marshall Trilogy essentially undercut the right of American Indians forever. Uh, for example, in Johnson versus McIntosh, the United States Supreme Court, Justice Marshall said that American Indians cannot own property. We have the right to occupy, but we don't have the right to own property. The government can for any reason, yank our property away because of something called the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery says that Christians have the right to take land from non-Christians, from American Indians, and so we have no legal rights to own property. We can be granted rights to own property, but we, we don't have a firm constitutional right to own property. My students are stunned when they, when they hear of this. Um, now contrast that with some of the uh, cases that have come down in the 1980s from the Supreme Court of Canada, which has started to return land rights to indigenous people. So there is definitely, I think, a divergence between Canada and the United States as to how natives are treated legally. I'm wondering if you want to I mean, expand what, on that. Well, I mean, I think there was a real leadership in American indigenous intellectuals and activists in the 60s and 70s. A lot of, particularly in the West, a lot of Canadian indigenous leaders came, and I'm not very good on the names and things, but they came to really edgy meetings in the sort of Northwest of the United States, and they got a lot of ideas from American and indigenous leaders and activists. Uh, uh, and I think it's still very edgy here. I mean, you know, there are lots of people like you who are doing really great things. But y the difference is, is that in Canada, it's 5 to 7% of the population, the Supreme Court, uh, guaranteed in the Constitution. And, and so when people stop talking about the fight between Anglophones and Francophones, they have to talk about Indigenous people. Like, it's the third pillar of the country. Whereas here, as you know, the, the, the conversation is... Uh, uh, African Americans and then Hispanics. So you're you're in a tough position in terms of your 
I guess, of your influence. Is that fair? I think that's fair. And, and you know, there's a, an interesting point, which I, I guess I intuited, but I didn't really know in this book. And John just kind of hinted at it. Let me, let me ask you to explain it a little more. John says that, that Canada rests upon a triangular foundation of indigenous uh, uh, laws and, 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 and models, francophone and anglophone. So there's a triangular foundation of Canadian society that doesn't exist here. I mean, do you want to explain? Because I'm not sure that we, we grasp the triangular foundation of Canadian society. Yeah, so I mean, I think the really interesting, I made my sarcastic opening about, you know, the Western model of the nation state, the Westphalian model. And, and, and so, and, you know, I talked about the links between these books and my Voltaire's Bastards, the unconscious civilization and things. Um, you know, the West has convinced itself with guns and other things that we're the leaders. We're on our way back to where we were at about uh, 1680 when China and India had half the world economy. We're on our way back there. But using our guns and so on, we knocked them out, destroyed their cotton industry. The guy who wrote The History of Cotton is here. and it's, He's really, really interesting. He's on tomorrow, and it just explains that. I mean, this is a gigantic industry, and the English went for the throat of the, of the Indian cotton industry and played a key role in the rise of slavery in the United States because it's the British Industrial Revolution and the industry coming into the cotton slave uh, industry in the United States. that, that it, The British made the real money out of it, actually, the British and the French. Anyway, um, uh, uh, so I, I think what's... what Sorry, I've lost your question. I got well, carried away. Well, the question away. was, what's the triangular <laughs> foundation of well, Canadian yeah, so, society? So, so the reason I started on this dithyram is that that the Western idea really comes out of um, the uh, uh, Westphalian peace treaty, which ended the wars of religion in Europe in seven, early 1700s. I, mean, I think 1648. I'm so glad. There you are. And that really set the model of what I would call the monolithic nation state. The monolithic nation state, which the United States pretends to be and is not which England, France, Germany, Spain, all pretend to be, which is, you know, uh, one religion, one race, one mythology, uh, etc. And for the United States, this is an impossible position because, of course, it isn't true at all, right, about what the United States is. And, and you know, we thought it had all come to an end between 1914 and 1945 when the West led by the Europeans, had a suicidal um, civil war which took 100 million lives. Nobody in the history of the world has ever managed a civil war in which 100 million people died in 40 years. And that was in order to protect the idea of the monolithic nation state in which there were no natives and there were no black people. There were only, you know, the English, the French, the Germans, etc. So Canada being a lousy poverty-stricken, isolated colony in the north, right? Not of great interest to the empires, except for the, the natural resources they could get out of us. Really, they didn't pay much attention to us. They just wanted us not to do what you'd done, <laughs> right? So they kind of let us get away with a lot of stuff, and they didn't really want to come to see us. I mean, we were the senior member of the British Empire. The first time a British monarch came to see us was in 1939, why? Because they were worried we wouldn't want do what we did in 1914, which was send an enormous part of our men to fight for the British Empire. That's the only reason they came. You know, I mean, they, they'd had us for hundreds of years. They never showed up. You know, they sent other people. Well, I bothered to go to this crazy poor place with the national bird as the mosquito. You know, and and, um, and uh, it, in that process of our dependence from the arrival of the Europeans in the 1500s to sometime in the 19th century, depending on where you were, indigenous people were either dominant or partners. We couldn't move around without them. There's a very famous statue of Champlain. And, uh, you've got a Quebec street somewhere around here. So you, you French Canadians came here, right? Uh, Champlain, the great ex explorer, quotes unquote, in Ottawa on a hill, pointing up the Ottawa River, which is the way across the continent. And he's pointing majestically up the hill. There used to be, uh, um, probably a Wyandotte, Huron, on his knees uh, it, beside him. They made them take that away. And, um, and of course, everybody thinks it's, 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 it's the great man saying, that way, boys. In fact, he's saying, where the hell are we? 
And the guy on his knees, because indigenous people are smart enough to know you don't stand up if you don't need to, right? You don't, only if you have an inferiority complex do you feel the need to stand up and point. Um, uh, he's saying, well, sir, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we'll show you where we're going, providing you are in a partnership with us of an appropriate nature. And Champlain goes, it's in his, in his uh, memoir, in his diaries, goes straight from there to the Chaudière Falls, which is the first big barrier going west, which is one of the most important spiritual sites in North America. And there, there are uh, uh, spiritual leaders. And before you're allowed beyond the, the falls, you do a tobacco offering. So Champlain gets beyond the first big barrier, thanks to the indigenous people allowing him to make an offering. So the point is that up until Indigenous peoples always said, this is a crazy idea. You keep saying Canada is based on two founding peoples, the French and the English. Totally inaccurate. It was never the English, it was the Scots and the Irish. And it was never the French, it was the Normans and the Bretons. You know, but that's all about the, those empires, right? And, um, and I wrote this book, uh, Reflections of a Siamese Twin, and I said what the Indigenous leaders had always said, which I simply said, you know, that's complete garbage. That Canada is built on a triangular foundation in order, indigenous, francophone, anglophone, not race, language, culture. Uh, and then on top of that, with every wave of immigration, we built a skyscraper. And then the kids on each floor, whether it's Spanish or Italian or Chinese, you know, they start running up and down the stairs and rappelling up the windows and doing whatever the hell they want. And you end up with something which is non-monolithic. So the model of the Canadian nation state is, has been because we were not important, we were able to build from the very beginning a non-monolithic model. Well, that, that, that is fascinating. And I, I just want to you know, trace one of the, you know, I want to trace the argument here. And one of the most fascinating chapters in the book is when you talk about some easy fixes that can be made. So if it's not clear by now, John is tracing how there's been a remarkable comeback and, and respect for indigenous people's values and contributions in Canada. Coming. It's coming. Although it's coming, although there's so much more that could be done. Now a again, lot. yeah, as a side note, I'm wondering if the same exists in the United States. When you said there were so many wonderful indigenous PhDs and such, um, in the United States there are exactly eight uh, indigenous uh, in political science PhD holders. I'm one of them. Eight. Not 80, not 8,000. Eight. And so we have such a tremendous problem with higher education and indigenous people in this country. And so my, my hair kind of curled when you gave us those figures. But one of, I, and I want to use that as a jumping off point, because even though there has been a remarkable comeback, which is coming in Canada, you mention in the book, you have a wonderful chapter where you talk about some solutions. And I think we could all probably gain from those here. So some that you mentioned, I think could apply to the United States as well in our treatment of indigenous peoples. There are three, and I'll just start with one. You said, stop underfunding education for indigenous peoples. And I'm wondering if you, you know, then you also mentioned improve housing on indigenous reservations. If you don't know this, 40% of housing on American native reservations are without electricity or running water. Uh, it's true, it's, it's, it's outrageous in this day and age. My, my own auntie who just uh, walked on last month, she was 85 years old, she had to go out and gather firewood. And in South Dakota, it gets, it gets cold. You can freeze to death. And, uh, you know, if she didn't gather firewood, she's dying. Because you're from uh, South Dakota area, right? My, nation, my nation is in South Dakota. That's right. And so, um, so you mentioned some easy solutions, a microfinance system for natives, improving education, and improving housing. And obviously, I agree with all of those. And I'm wondering if you want to speak on that a little bit. Well, I mean, I think that... Um, you know, the remains of the colonial system at its worst can be seen in how through clever stubbornness, bureaucracies, the politicians hardly ever have to intervene. Bureaucracies have inherited, it's now like 150 years, have inherited these policies. And unless you actually shut down those bureaucracies or do something radical, it's not gonna change. They're not gonna change, I promise you. You know, and I say the same in Canada, I promise you. It's uh, uh, my tax on the department of whatever they call it now, but it used to be called Indian Affairs, are well known. And, um, uh, it, you know, th th essentially what we're talking about here is not indigenous rights. We're talking about human rights. So people have the right to be citizens in multiple ways. 
I mean, no Canadian Indigenous person has to stand up for the national anthem. We don't put our hand over the heart, you know, and if you kneeled, people would say, are you tying your shoelace? Um, it's, sorry, that's a joke. Uh, you know, people would not get upset. But the, the point is that, that you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. You can be, think of yourself as not Canadian, but First Nation, uh, that doesn't mean you don't have the right as a Canadian. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not hypocrisy, that's reality. You have the right to the same level of education. In fact, you, they should be paying, spending probably $1.50 on indigenous schooling for every dollar spent on non-indigenous schooling. Why? Well, for the 50% who are outside of cities. Why? Because we all know, and it's much worse in Canada than here, because of the, the geography, that we've designed education, healthcare, housing, you, you, water for cities, small cities, big towns, medium-sized towns, and then all the urbanites, the sophisticated you know, double espresso urbanites, no cappuccino, please, you know, start complaining that it's costing money to support people in unprofitable communities. In our case, you can imagine, it's three quarters of the country, or two thirds of the country. How, I mean, why don't they just move to the city for God's sake, you know? And, and what, there's a real need for us to say, A, if it's a real country, we have to sit back and say these are human rights, and you can't say you have a country if people don't live in two-thirds of it. It doesn't belong to the timber companies and the mining companies. They'd be happy if everybody left. And it was just for them to exploit, right? They'd be very happy. But the fact is that the rea what makes it real is that today there are sort of 60-something thousand Inuit. And that's an historic high. They're, historically, it would have been about 20,000. Yeah, so because of you know, healthcare and things, it's tripled, but that hasn't solved a lot of the problems. Mm -hmm. um, and the population is growing very fast in these smaller communities, but we don't have a philosophy of how to make small communities function in their own terms. Mm -hmm. This is a big task, it's a human rights task, and it has to do with first class education, which is gonna be more expensive than urban education, first class healthcare, much more expensive than urban healthcare, uh, water, I think that's a really easy one, the water, the bad water shows the bad, the ill will, in my view, because that's such an easy one to fix. You know, it shows that they're unwilling to go out there and do it. We have to fix those things. And it's, our, it's the money we've taken and our control over it, which is the matter. Now, in the last four years, they've really moved on the education funding. And they've done something which is a real beginning of a turnaround, which is that one of the big things here and in Canada and in Australia uh, was you can destroy a people by destroying their language. And as a former president of Penn, I used to get up and say all the time, you know, one of the most severe forms of, of removal of freedom of expression is to remove someone's language. And we set out to do that with these schools and so on. Well, we have, I don't know what you've got here, we've got 70 indigenous languages still. Some of them are very healthy, some are not in terms of numbers. And for the first time, a, a federal government has actually put in a law, I don't think it was passed, they should have put it in earlier, a pass, they put a law into parliament with a multi-million dollar uh, budget to support indigenous languages. And it's actually happening in the public school system mm -hmm. that you can go in downtown Toronto, my grandson, his optional courses in grade nine, one of them was Ojibwe. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, we're just at the beginning of it, but you know, language, education, water, housing, and I think completely rethinking what communities look like. We have to stop sending architects and engineers into indigenous communities and saying, okay, 12 lines like this, 12 like this, and a bunch of bungalows that belong in a suburb of Boulder, or whatever. Where are the conversations with indigenous people about what is, what is architecture in the, in the philosophical and geographical uh, and land imagination and history of this, these people? What does that look like put together with modern architecture? We could be inventing some really fabulous stuff, we, they, uh, which would have a big impact on how horrible our, our suburbs are. You know? How industrial our suburbs are.
Well, I, I know that we have a time. I I'm gonna throw one more question. I know then we're gonna open it up to the audience. So, I, you know, one thing that I promised to come back to is, is, is there a comeback here in the United States? I can tell you legally for indigenous people, no. Uh, Native people lose about 90% of the time when they appear before the United States Supreme Court. I know that's not the case in Canada. Um, hopefully, it was, but uh, well, it's for, not. Not now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you know, is there a comeback artistically? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> blowing my own horn here, three, uh, uh, two of my friends and I, we just graduated from the Institute of American Indian Arts, Tommy Orange, my classmate, Therese Mayo, um, all of us just got uh, contracts with big publishing houses, so hopefully we're, we're getting the arts out there. But is there a comeback happening politically for natives in the United States? We did elect a handful of natives uh, to Congress here this last election. I don't think we're at the same place that Canada is. And so my last question, what can the average American and Canadian do, what is the average Canadian and American's role in supporting the native revitalization? What, what can we do, if anything? Well, well, I think the first is to be conscious. You know, being unconscious of something is the first betrayal of citizenship. Pretending you don't know. And I will say that the characteristic of, you know, of the Americas and of Australia, not so much New Zealand, is that we are still uncomfortable with the fact that this place had people in it when we arrived. The terra, what is it, terra nullis, is that what you say? That's right. That's terra nullis right. argument, which means, oh, there was nobody here. I mean, yesterday, I, I won't say, I mean, I was brought here by somebody, and I said, there must be a lot of indigenous people in this state. They said, well, not really, no, there's nobody here, really. Well, maybe over in the south corner. I mean, that's what they say in, in Argentina. I remember, they'd, you know, they'd say, oh, no, there's, there's never anyone here. They, they killed them all. That's why. Well, there actually are, but they're off in the mountains. Um, so I think to be absolutely conscious and clear about the situation. And the second thing is to say, you just got to get over this European idea that if, if they were here before us, therefore we're not the founding people. We are not the founding people. We are not the founding people. Is it such a big deal? I mean, is this such an attack on the male, malehood? I would principally put it to the men, that you literally can't, you know, have sex if you admit that you weren't the founding people. <laughs> I mean, come on, you really take this seriously. And I think that there is under the, under the surface, just under the surface, there's an enormous nervousness about how can one be the model for the world if in fact there were great civilizations here and they're still here. And they had some brilliant ideas. And they're still brilliant ideas. And in fact, their ideas on, for example, the environmental crisis are far more sophisticated. If you look at indigenous philosophy, not romantically, you look at indigenous philosophy. I mean, I know the Canadian, like Richard Attlee, all these great philosophers. It's so much ahead of the rational, linear, utilitarian approaches of the West, which are getting in the way of us doing something. It's not just money. It's the methodology. So I think that you have to be conscious. I say this to Canadians, so you won't mind me saying it to you. Um, you have to accept that it's happening. It's a problem all through the Americas and in other parts of the world. And that there are really valuable things that indigenous people have to contribute in and of their own right. And, um, and then I just finish with a, a, a technical point, since you're a lawyer which is that the American Supreme Court, and, and I could be wrong on this, so, but I've read a fair amount, but I could still be very wrong. Um, I take risks and I don't care being wrong, as long as someone points it out. <laughs> um, that the American Supreme Court is very nationalistic and doesn't like to use references from courts outside the United States. Is that right? That's 100% correct. Good, okay. So this is an enormous mistake, and I think people should be speaking up about this. I can tell you, that the Canadian Supreme Court, the Australian and the New Zealand Supreme Courts are talking to each other all the time and referring to each other's successes. And that's how we've managed to move ahead. That's how we got out of the pockets of despair. And I'm gonna give you two quick examples. One is something called the Honor of the Crown. It was a big series of cases. And basically, the civil servants came with their lawyers so clever and, and argue the, the little pockets and the little holes that they hadn't done wrong in terms of this particular case. They just screwed the indigenous people in, in Vancouver out of a whole bunch of money and, and land, but they hadn't broken the law. And the, it was written by, I think, the head of the Supreme Court in, sometime in the 90s, and he basically said, you know, there is a question of the honor of the crown. The crown is the source of legitimacy. It's not the 
not the queen, it's the crown, it's the source of legitimacy. And you have, you have uh, humiliated the honor of the crown and you as employees of the crown do not have the right to put the crown in the dirt. I mean, that's not the way they wrote it, but that's what they said. And the, the non-indigenous population haven't been smart enough yet to say, we could use that when, when injustice is done to us. The most interesting case for me, I mean, there have been great cases since, uh, like Chilcotin is the most recent one, which is a fabulous case on, 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 on whether the crown ever eliminated the fundamental rights of indigenous people, which is the fundamental question. And they said, they basically said to the government, we told you this in this case, we told you it again in that case, we told you again in that case, and each case they got clearer and clearer over 20 years, and they said, we're tired of telling you this, so here it is, so simple that even you can understand it. And now the government's trying to figure out what to do, right, because they said, you didn't have the right to take it away. So in a case of the 90s called Delgamut, West Coast uh, word which I can't spell, as usual with West Coast words, they're really complex, uh, Indigenous group nation came and made an argument, government argued against it, it was about land and rights, and at the end it was a very complicated ruling written by this old French Canadian chief justice with a waxed mustache. When you looked at him you thought, this guy could never do anything that wasn't conservative, right? And, um, and he wrote this brilliant thing, and it, he ended by, and, and the, the indigenous, the, the government argument was, Here's the government document, all written clearly, a couple of pages. Here are the signatures, indigenous signatures. Here are the documents year after year showing the payments made to indigenous people. So everything is in law, according to the British, the French, the Americans, and the Canadians, this is law. And the indigenous people stood up as they'd been doing for years, stood up and the lawyer said, I'm simplifying grossly, said, here is chief, you know, high eagle, I don't remember now, uh, who is the inheritor of the firekeeper or, or the memory responsibility of the person who was there on the day of the negotiation of the agreement? And he will explain. So he stood up and sat down a couple of hours later. You know, and he basically said, you know, uh, the, our chief came over the hill, he was where, on a pony which had two scars on the left back leg, uh, there were three uh, clouds going over the sky which meant that we couldn't at first see the scar on the face of the governor negotiating. At 9.03 the governor sat down, you know, boom, 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 boom. And the chief justice wrote, um, in this case, choosing between the written proof and the oral memory, there is no question that the oral memory is more accurate. So this was a revolutionary moment in Western law judgment, which again, the non-indigenous people have been too foolish and simple to understand that this is an enormous breakthrough against bad law. It was, and I just want to add to that as well. So not only the Delgamo case, and also in Australia, the Mabo case. Well, Mabo is amazing. Yeah. Mabo, so you have two former you know, uh, British colonies, and, and just in the last 30 years, they have made decisions granting some further degree of land rights to indigenous people, whereas in America, we have not made that at all. So Johnson versus McIntosh is still good law and is still being cited. So it's interesting how Canada and Australia are, are making some changes And New Zealand. Here. And New Zealand as well, that's right, that's right. And those so, changes are changing the countries. Yeah, yeah. They're so, changing the countries profoundly, slowly, slowly. So, uh, fascinating stuff, but I know that we want to turn it over to some wonderful questions here. Right, so we have microphones on either side, so if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand, and the most urgent hand is you. Yes, um... I have, I have a friend who works for Greenpeace UK, and he was saying that Greenpeace since, and? Greenpeace UK? Yeah. And he was telling me that since Standing Rock, Greenpeace has really shifted its focus towards working with indigenous people. So it sounds to me as if, it sounds to me as if uh, that's, you know, uh, that kind of idea is very much advanced in Canada. But I'm just wondering if that, is happening, how much, how, to what degree is that happening in, in the States? Uh, in the States, 
not at all, really. I mean, after the Standing Rock debacle, uh, uh, they're still building a pipeline across my land in South Dakota. So again, unfortunately, I believe we're, we're lagging. So, but I, do you want to add something? Well, I mean, I think that the you know the incredible rise of the NGOs in a, a thirty-year period, from sort of a couple of hundred to millions of them and, and tens of millions of people involved in them, have largely been top-down and largely been urban. I mean, what we're seeing with this young woman today, that's bottom up. That's why all those people are so uncomfortable about her, because it's bottom up, you know? And so I think it's been very tough for a lot of the NGOs to actually realize that if you're going to work in areas like the environment and, uh, and human rights, you actually have to work from the grassroots up. And that means it, it's not enough to have an office in a big city and do good. You actually, it's very, very, very complicated. And I mean, I see this because of, I saw this early on because of Penn, because we're not an NGO. We're this messy, chaotic thing of all these writers on the ground who are getting arrested, beaten up, killed every day. Uh, and it builds up from there. And I, I remember when I became president and at the first annual Congress, I said to them, look, I'm gonna say something really uncomfortable here. We have to lie. We have to lie because in order to get money, we have to fill out the forms of all the foundations and so on, and they're all written for NGOs. We're not an NGO, we're a grassroots movement. So you just have to lie when you're filling out the forms. Pretend you're an NGO, but the reality is it's up. And I think that the, the smarter NGOs are realizing that if they need to partner with indigenous people, and they need to learn how to stop telling people what to do, and learn how to listen and work with them. I mean, when... Oh, the great battle for the forests off the west coast of Vancouver Island about 30 years ago. I can't remember what it was called now. A lot of Americans were involved in it. And a friend of mine, Richard Atlio, who's one of the finest indigenous philosophers I know, was the honorary chief at the time. And he was the tough nut that led the way. He's the one that forced the government to back down. And the NGOs followed him. You know. Great. Thanks. Sure, thank you. I wanted to ask a couple of things, uh, and I did want to bring in New Zealand, but the, the issue is in, 19, uh, in the 1970s, for example, a trend maybe you could speak to is the fact that men who'd come back from the war were now going into, they'd been educated and gone off to the workplace as management and, and employees. Women began to fill uh, their places in college. So women coming into the be educated is if you could speak to that, and also the fact that birth control for the first time, they could actually plan their families and plan education first and family second. Um, as another impetus for what might have happened in Canada too, as more people began, uh, that they began being recognized as exemplified by uh, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand. She is one of those people who grew up in that era. She, she brought her baby now, as a prime minister and nursed, you know, brought her baby into the parliament, which was a big deal for women around the world to see a woman standing up because she'd been educated, because she had a career path, and she, her children were woven into her, her child was born, woven yeah, into her I mean, path. I think, I think that, the, you know, there's no question that there are two factors there. One is, as we know, um, one of the characteristics of the rational movement in the West was that it was built on the destruction of whatever rights women had. You know, I mean, all these professors standing up and talking about the rise of reason completely forget a number of things that it involved, and one of them was the elimination of the remaining rights of women, which were peculiar and tenuous, but in the Middle Ages were a lot stronger than they were in the 19th century. You know, this is not said. The women's rights were removed in the 19th century. Women had the, if they were property owners in Canada, women had the vote until 1851. And not that many voted because it was such a drunken mayhem around the hustings where you went to vote and s shout out loud who you were going to vote for that very few women could get through. It was the rich women who went to vote. Um, the conservative women went to vote in groups at the last minute, like you'd vote for a week. And, uh, and they, everybody knew what the numbers were and the conservatives would keep these women back and then they'd, bring out a, they'd come out with a whole bunch of men with clubs and fight their way through the crowd and then they'd vote and then they'd disappear. In 1851, the right was taken away and they didn't get it back until, until it started in 1914 and ended in 1919. Um, so there's no question that indigenous communities 
have a very much stronger history of the role of women. Much, much stronger history. And we did everything we could to weaken that, as every, every Western society did, uh, but we never really broke it. Certainly not in Canada, I don't think we broke it. Certainly even in Australia, where it was appalling. Certainly not in New Zealand. And I always remember, I, I'll tell you a simple story. Uh, when I thought I knew what I was doing, and I didn't, um, and I was the president of Canadian Pen, I think, and there was a government in that hated the criticism coming from indigenous people, so they took away the subsidies of their publications, federal subsidies. So we, we said we would support them, you know, Freedom of Expression Organization, and so I said I'd go and meet a group of them in a hotel in Toronto, and very busy young man, well-dressed, PhD, one. Um, and, uh, you know, I arrived, and there was a room with some elders, some women of different ages, some young men. And I said, look, I'm really thrilled to be here, and um, we're going to support you 100%. And I'm, look, I'm terribly sorry I've got an hour. And as soon as I said I've got an hour, I saw this wall go down over everybody's faces, like just like that. And then a woman stepped forward, and she said, well, it's so kind of you, Mr. Saul. So kind of you to come and offer to help us. Now look, we've just got to finish some business with the elders here. Would you mind waiting outside? Exactly 60 minutes later, they opened the door. <laughs> By about 45 minutes, I realized my profound stupidity. And I canceled all my appointments and they opened the door and I came in and I laughed. I said, listen, I apologize. I was wrong. I canceled everything. Do what you want with me, you know? <laughs> And, but, you know, you learn. You, you have to learn to learn whatever your age is and whatever your education is. I know we have a question back okay. here. From waiting. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention that in this country right now, we are so very fortunate to celebrate and to look forward to Joy Harjo as our new Poet Laureate. Bravo! What, 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 bravo! What can I say? She, it, it, it's wonderful, and there, there, again, there's a real renaissance. Um, let me just write a couple names, not including my own. Jake Skeets. There are wonderful native poets, native nonfiction writers, native scholars, and and native fiction writers that are coming out, and and we honor uh, Joy Harjo, and and all the others, the elders that led the way for us. So thank you for mentioning that. And I think you will see, in spite of the lower population percentage, as this grows, it will have an effect. It will have an effect because it's true. And, and I think that what intellectuals have to think of themselves as, and I know you do, and I'm sure many of your colleagues do, is you have to, we have to think of ourselves, indigenous or not, as uh, we have brushes on which there is no paint. There's paint remover. We have to remove the lies and the false mythologies. Mm -hmm. And then the truth will speak for itself. But first, we have to, we can't argue against it. We have to remove it. And I always think of myself as a, a guy with a hell of a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Paint remover? Paint, paint thinner. Paint, not thinner, the stuff that <laughs> makes paint, what? Paint, paint stripper, we're paint strippers of um, false mythology. Quick question, has to be quick. I, two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Quick, uh, my wife is uh, Haida. Oh, and uh, we, wow. okay, we could talk a little later about that. But she and I are both involved in the Rising Voices movement here, which is in its seventh going on eighth year, where indigenous wisdom speakers are getting together with uh, meteorological scientific experts right here in uh, Boulder on an annual basis. We've had five of the seven meetings here and hosted uh, things in our house. And in particular, I want to talk about UNDRIP, uh, the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, the only four countries not to sign it after 20 years of negotiation were the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. One of the things that people may not know is that in the recent... Canada has now signed it. Uh, I, I, I know, yes, but when we say sign it, the key question is, do you require, as UNDRIP does, informed consent or actually just uh, consultation? And people may not have noticed that in the recent uh, climate change uh, presentation of all the Democratic candidates, Elizabeth Warren was asked a question by a Louisiana member of Rising Voices, and she said, if elected, I will uh, demand informed consent 
not just consultation, mm. which was the Obama uh, a policy. So do either of you know uh, about whether Canada, Australia, New Zealand have moved to actual informed consent or only collaboration? I, I, you go ahead. Well, I'll just say a little bit about UNDRIP. I, again, uh, we only have a few minutes here. Um, it, it, it's it's a, a, a declaration passed by the United Nations, but it's advisory. It's not binding. And so the problem here is, although I love it and what it stands for, it's, it's only advisory, and it, it, part of it is that you're supposed to give reparations for the land back to the indigenous people. How's that gonna work here in the United States if we make this into law? How do you, how do you compensate a people for the loss of a continent? I mean, there's not enough money in the United States economy. And so it's, it's problematic in a number of ways. I am fascinated to hear about the Rising Voices movement. Again, a problem though is, um, I went to college here in Boulder, and look, I don't think indi many indigenous people can afford to live here, okay? You know, even in Denver, we're getting priced out. You know, uh, there's an Indian bar in Denver called the White Horse. I went there last weekend. There's not one native person in there because we're getting priced out of Colorado. And so I just don't know. Nationwide, the meetings are here, okay. So but I think that what's at the base of this though, interestingly enough is, I, 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 you know more than I do, you're the lawyer. Um, and and I, it makes perfect sense what you're saying. But I think, you remember what I was saying, that how uncomfortable particularly the men are, the non-indigenous men are, with the idea that we weren't, we're not the founding people. And that this agreement, this international agreement, lies, you know, even if it's only a, a consultancy, it, 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 to admit to it is to agree that we are not the founding people and that there were real civilizations here before and that they're still here and that they're still important, and they're getting bigger and more important. Throughout the Americas, the, Ar the Argentinians in 2000 were in total denial that there ever were indigenous people. Now they'll talk about it. So I think it's a, psychologically it's a very important one, and I think, thank goodness you're doing this work. The Haida are fantastic. I, uh, you know, and you, you've got a Haida wife. What, what's your family name, if I ask her? Uh, well, uh, and I shouldn't even ask. Really. Oh, really? <laughs> 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. I, lo I, I love Haida Gwaii. It's one of the most mystical places in the world. And Guja, the, the, who was the firekeeper and became the chief, and is amazing, amazingly. And of course, one of the things that Western politicians could learn from indigenous leaders is you don't know how to be funny. You're dead. You're dead. You know, so when I see these guys these senators and stuff being dead serious, they have no idea how to talk with people because they don't have that human capacity to be funny. So my, my last comment and then I, is, is um, I, I, I think for me, you know, as a non-indigenous person, writing these books, which had at first some indigenous stuff in it and then a lot, when I, when I published uh, A Fair Country and said, you know, actually, you know, Canada, all the, all the things we did wrong came from Britain and France, and the interesting stuff came from the indigenous people. And I thought, well, I guess my career is over now. And, you know, but actually, people said, oh, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, I mean, you know, for example, if you look at our immigration policy and citizenship policy, there isn't a single traceable footnote or route back to Europe. The way we do it is the exact opposite of what the Europeans do, and it's quite different from what the States does. And so when you examine it, it all comes back to what the poverty-stricken dependent immigrants for 250 to 300 years learnt from indigenous people. Our immigration policy is entirely indigenous. It's about circles, it's about inclusion, it's about we'll let you into the circle, and that's, now let's figure out how we're gonna live together. It's about uh, v complexity. It's, we owe it entirely to indigenous people. The first time I said that on stage, because reading a book is one thing, saying it in front of a thousand people is another. I thought, well, and then people, I, there was this silence. And they sort of looked at me. And you know, a couple of seconds is long, right? And after about 15 seconds, they started applauding because in their hearts, they knew it was true. They just didn't know how to say it. And that's the role of writers. All we do is provide language, right? And so the last sentence is, all these books I've written about the world, Voltaire's Bastards, The Collapse of Globalism, all this stuff, have become increasingly different as I've understood what I didn't know. And the influence of indigenous philosophy 
on what I write that's read by Europeans and Americans and whatever is increasingly what it is because of indigenous ideas. So, thank you. Brilliant. Oh. And